All right, family, you guys ready to dive head first into God's word this morning? Oh, let me hear you. Are you ready to dive into God's word this morning? Yeah. Let's go deep. Let's get out in that deep water and get submerged. I'm going to give Taylor just a second to get Pastor Tanner's video. Um, we're tag teaming the message today. Pastor Tanner's got an awesome video to start with. Then he's going to tag me in, and then I'm going to tag Brother Sean in. So um, there he is. Look at that guy. Ain't he cute? Yeah. We love you, PT. So as we listen to the word today, we're going to be finishing up the series on the fruit of the Holy Spirit. So today we're talking about self-control. So open your ears, open your minds, open your hearts, and let's learn. Amen? some family down in southern Missouri and this morning I'm speaking at Endurance Church in West Plains for Pastor Jerry Heath so I hope you guys are able to enjoy our service here at home today I'm gonna to be tag teaming a message with Pastor Mike and Sean I'm gonna get things kicked off and then they're gonna come and share some awesome things with you as well I'm praying that God speaks to your heart and shows you some new things about himself what we're going to be doing this morning is we're going to wrap up our current series called The Source. And we're going to do this by talking about the final fruit of the Holy Spirit, self-control. If you're anything like me, this is probably the one that you struggle with most consistently. Out of all of the fruit, this is the, one, this is the one fruit of the Spirit that I even tend to groan about. When I hear about self-control, I'm like, oh man, that is not easy. Actually, I have found that it is completely impossible for me to live out self-control on my own. Simply put, self-control is the ability to control oneself. It involves things like moderation, constraint, and the ability to say no to my fleshly desires. One of the proofs that God is working in our lives is the ability to control our thoughts, our words, and our actions. Our human nature has been weakened by the influence of sin. The Bible calls this being a slave to sin. In Romans 6, 6, it says, For we know that our old self was crucified with Jesus, so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, and that we should no longer be slaves to sin. In other words, sin should no longer have control over our lives because Jesus has died on the cross for us and has set us free, and the Holy Spirit is now operating within us. One powerful definition of the word sin is fulfilling a legitimate need through illegitimate means. What does that mean? It means that we have these desires that are natural to us being human beings, but when we go about fulfilling those natural desires in ways that are outside of God's plan and purpose for us, those illegitimate ways, that's when it becomes sin. Without the, without the power of the Holy Spirit, we are incapable of knowing or choosing how to best meet our needs. Even if we knew what was best, such as not over not overeating, another need like the desire to be comfortable all the time would come and take precedence and it would enslave us. So when we're living in our own power, we are often slaves to ourselves, to our own desires. When we're saved by Christ's sacrifice, though, we become free. In Galatians 5, chapter, 5, chapter, uh, 5 verse 1, it says, It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then, and do not let yourself be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. In other words, don't go back voluntarily and put your hand in the cuffs and your neck in the stock. Don't go back and allow those things that used to own you to have control now. This liberty includes, a mother, uh, includes among other things, freedom from our sin. Our old self was crucified with Jesus so that the body of sin might be done away with, that we would no longer be slaves to it. 
Now, as the Spirit gives us self-control, we have the, the ability to refuse sin. Believers need self-control. Because this outside world, the world that we go out into every single Sunday after church, it is full of internal forces that attack us. It's full of these things that draw us back into that old lifestyle, that old way of thinking. In Romans chapter 7, verse 21, it says, So I find this law at work in me. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work inside of me. It's waging war against the law of my mind, and it's making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. Oh, what a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Thanks be to God, who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, I myself in my mind am a slave to God's law. But in my sinful nature, I am a slave to the law of sin. We don't exhibit self-control if we continually mess around with things that, take, that make us captive. So Paul is experiencing something that you and I experience every day. I don't want to do these things, but I keep falling into them. Why is that? Because I'm still warring against that sinful nature. And it is the Holy Spirit and the fruit of self-control that sets me free from those things. So each week we've talked about an imitation of the fruit that we were discussing. These imitations are not as good because they fall short of God's standard and desire for our life. The imitation of self-control is willpower. Over the past year, as I lost weight, I had a lot of people come to me and say, oh man, you must have a ton of willpower. And to that, I would just kind of laugh and say, you know, the past 18 years of my life is pretty strong evidence that I do not have strong willpower. The problem with willpower is that it is based on me. When my will changes, depending on circumstance and situation, so does my power to say no to the bad things and my ability to say yes to the good things. Jesus identified this weakness of willpower in the Garden of Eden. In Matthew chapter 26, 41, it says, Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. It is only when I submit fully to Jesus that I begin to have some level of control of myself more and more as I allow the Holy Spirit to move in my life. But that power comes only from the Spirit. My will is not strong enough, but Jesus is. A good example of this in the Bible is Samson. Now, we don't have time this morning to cover the whole story of Samson, so I encourage you to go and check it out in the book of Judges from chapters 13 to 16. It's a quick read, and it's an enjoyable story. But I do want to cover some of the highlights for the purpose of talking about self-control. In Judges chapter 13, verses 2 through 5, we get a little bit of insight into what's going to happen. It says, there was a man of the city of Zorah. His name was Manoah. And he was from the clan of the Danites. This is one of the 12 tribes of Israel. He had a wife who was childless. That means that she was unable to give birth. The angel of the Lord appeared to her. Now remember, when we see that phrase, angel of the Lord, it's actually talking about the pre-incarnate Jesus who showed up um, in this form before he actually took his human form on earth. And the angel said to her, you are barren and childless. But you're going to become pregnant, and you're going to give birth to a son. Now see to it that you drink no wine or other fermented drink, and that you do not eat anything unclean. You will become pregnant, and you will have a son whose head is to never be touched by a razor, because the boy is to be a Nazarite, de dedicated to God from the womb. He will take the lead in delivering Israel from the hands of the Philistines. So... The angel of the Lord, Jesus, comes and speaks to this woman, to Samson's mother, and says, I'm going to set you apart. 
And I want you to live a life that is holy, that is set apart to God, because your son is going to be holy and his life is going to be set apart to God. This is what it means to live a life of self-control. We no longer give into the things that everyone else is giving into. We set our lives apart to serve God only, not ourselves. Samson had a destiny. We see that in this passage. The angel says that God is going to use him to set the people of Israel free from the oppression of the Philistines. He had a specific call on God for his life to serve God. Unfortunately, his ability to serve God was often limited by the vices he allowed to control him. He had a lack of self-control. And a lack of self-control will prevent even the most gifted person from obtaining the greatness that God intends for their life. Samson had the ability to do amazing things. He tore a lion apart with his bare hands. You know what? We just got rid of a house cat because we were a little afraid of her. He tore a lion apart, barehanded. He caught 300 foxes and set his enemy's fields on fire by lighting their tails on fire. He, uh, he once went to a city gate and he ripped the city gates off, put them on his shoulders. These gates weighed thousands of pounds and he carried them miles up onto the top of a hill. One time when he was being attacked, he found a dead donkey, tore off its jawbone and killed a thousand of his enemies. And at the very end of his life, Samson, with his bare hands, pulled apart the pillars of a building and sent an entire building crashing down on his enemies, killing 3,000 of them in one moment. God used Samson's to do some incredible things. There was no lack of capability in Samson's life. Yet he ended up defeated, blind, entertainment for his enemies, and dead while still in his prime. Why? Because he lacked self-control. The spirit of the Lord was upon Samson's life, but he refused to walk in the spirit. Samson was all about instant gratification. If he saw something, he took it. Samson was impulsive. He didn't take time to consider whether or not something was best for him or whether or not something was godly. He just did it. If it felt good, Samson did it. He had a huge ego, which meant that he cared so much about um, people propping him up and making him feel good that he reacted negatively when he didn't get that uplifting attention. He kept engaging in ungodly romantic relationships. More than any other cause, I've seen that take people out of God's will more than anything else when they get themselves involved in a relationship that is ungodly. And finally, he had a sense of entitlement. Samson believed that because he was gifted and because God was using him, people owed him something, that he deserved to be able to do and have these things. But Galatians chapter 5, verse 24, tells us a different story. It says, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. This morning, we are called to live and walk in self-control because we belong to Jesus. And Jesus' death on the cross has crucified our sinful desires along with that flesh on the cross. Those passions are held in check and our desire and will comes into alignment, comes into alignment with God's. That's what it means to live in self-control. Now, Pastor Mike's going to come and share a little bit more. I love you guys. I'll see you next Sunday. Have an incredible rest of your morning. All right. So now we know what it is, what self-control is. Self-control is not willpower. Can I get an amen? amen. Uh, self-control. <laughs> hey, you, oh, why did he ask me to preach on this? Judges from chapters 13. I have a hard 16. time with self-control. Um, this morning I want to I want to share a couple of stories out of the Bible with another guy who had a problem with self-control. In, in his life, he exhibited we get a little incredible self-control. In some areas and in other areas, he just flew off the rails. And that's kind of like 
and the way I see my life. So I'm going to talk to you this morning about uh, David before he, he was king and then after he is king. So we want to dive into 1 Samuel 24, 1 through 11 for this very first one. And I'm going to read you the story of King Saul pursuing David in the desert. After Saul returned from pursuing the Philistines, he was told, David is in the desert of En Gedi. So Saul took 3,000 able young men from all Israel and set out to look for David and his men near the crags and the wild goats. He came to the sheep pens along the way. A cave was there, and Saul went in to relieve himself. David and his men were far back in the cave. The men said, this is the day the Lord spoke of when he said to you, I will give your enemy into your hands for you to deal with as you wish. So the angel of the Lord, David crept up on up unnoticed and cut a corner of Saul's robe off. And I want you to live afterward. David was conscience stricken for having cut the corner of his robe. He said to his men, the Lord forbid that I should do such a thing to my master. The Lord's anointed, or lay a hand on him, for he is the anointed of the Lord. With these words, David sharply rebuked his men and did not allow them to attack Saul. And Saul left the cave and went on his way. Then David went out of the cave and called to Saul, My Lord the king. When Saul looked behind him, David bowed down and prostrated himself with his face to the ground. He said to Saul, Why do you listen to why do you listen when men say David is bent on harming you? This day you have seen with your own eyes how the Lord delivered you from my hand in the cave. Some urged me to kill you, but I spared you. I said, I will not lay my hand on my Lord because he is the Lord's anointed. See, my father, look at this piece of your robe in my hand. I cut it off the corner of your robe and did not kill you. See that there is nothing in my hand to indicate that I am guilty of wrongdoing or rebellion. Now Saul was chasing David because he was afraid that David was going to kill him to take his throne. So David had to go on the run with 600 of his men. Um, they were in the wilderness, and they ended up in the desert of En Gedi, and the conditions were rough. They had to hide in the caves. They were constantly worried of being captured, which meant certain death by the hands of King Saul. Now Saul just didn't take a few guys out to look for him. Saul was so paranoid of David that he took 3,000 men to hunt these guys. When King Saul entered that cave in verses 4 through 7, David's men wanted him to kill him. That would have meant no more running, no more hiding. They would have got to go home. They would have got to be in peace. But David remembered the words of the Lord. When he snuck up on him, he's got this razor-sharp sword in his hand. And he could have taken Saul out. And the sword was so sharp that Saul probably wouldn't even have known it happened. But instead, he just cut a corner of that robe off. Now, he brought that back to his men, but his conscience was so heavy that he had even harmed the robe of uh, the man who was his father and, and his leader and the king of Israel, anointed by God, that, that in verse 6, he said, The Lord forbid that I should do such a thing to my master. The Lord's anointed. Or lay a hand on him, for he is anointed of God. David didn't kill him. And that showed amazing self-control. Because if I was in that place, and I was running in the desert, and I had to hunt for my food every day and search for water, and I had a chance to take out the one thing that was standing in my way to a comfortable life, back at home with my family and friends, I don't know. I don't know what I would have done. I probably would have done what a man would do, take him out, not listen to God. But David showed amazing self-control and strength by remembering and standing in the truth of God's word. And even, this is the thing, even though life was incredibly hard for David and his men right then, he is exactly where God wants him. Exactly 
where God wants him so that the plan of God can be fulfilled and his will will be done. I love that example of self-control because that is, that is powerful to me that you got a chance to make your life super easy. You know what's wrong, but man, I get to go home and you don't? Great example. David was strong then, but let's turn to 2 Samuel 11 and read uh, ch- or verses 1 through 17. And I want to talk to you about after David was king, uh, he fell down hard. And it reminds me of my life, how I have fallen. In the spring at the time when kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Reba, but David remained in Jerusalem. I want you to pay attention to that. One evening, David got up from his bed and walked around on the roof of his palace. From the roof, he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful, and David sent someone to find out about her. The man said, she is Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, and the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Then David sent messages to get her. She came to him, and he slept with her. Then she went back home. The woman conceived and sent word to David, saying, I am pregnant. So David sent word to Joab, send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent him to David. When Uriah came, David asked him how Joab was, how the soldiers were, and how the war was going. Then David said to Uriah, go down to your house, wash your feet. So Uriah left the palace, and a gift from the king was sent after him. But Uriah slept at the entrance of the palace with all the master's servants and did not go down to his house. David was told Uriah did not go home. So he asked Uriah, haven't you just come from a military campaign? Why did you not go home? Uriah said to David, the ark and Israel and Judah are staying in tents. And my commander Joab and my lord's men are camped in the open country. How could I go to my house and eat and drink and make love to my wife? As surely as you live, I will not do such a thing. And David said to him, stay here one more day. Tomorrow I'll send you back. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next. And David's invitation, he ate and drank with him and David made him drunk. But in the evening, Uriah went out to sleep on his mat along with the master's servants and didn't go home. In the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and he sent it with Uriah. In it he wrote, put Uriah out front where the fighting is fiercest. Then draw from him so he will be struck down and die. Then withdraw for him from him so he'll be struck down and die. So while Joab and the city was under siege, he put Uriah at the place where he knew the strongest defenders were. When the men of the city came out and fought against Joab, some of the men in David's army fell. Moreover, Uriah the Hittite died. Whew. Anybody ever been caught in a lie? And you got to make up another lie and another lie and another lie to keep covering your tracks. David, David was caught in a lie. His lack of self-control was unimaginable. He didn't just sleep with a woman who wasn't his wife. He slept with a woman that was another man's wife. And he got her pregnant. And he tried to cover it up with the lies. And when the deceit and the deceiving way he wanted him to, he wanted Uriah to go sleep with his wife so it made it look like the child was Uriah's. Instead of coming clean, Uriah was such a man of honor and such a man of courage that that he didn't want to betray the men that he fought alongside in the field. He stayed. And David out of desperation not to be caught, had him killed. 
And it was so easy for David to fall into this pit of no self-control because he wasn't where God intended him to be. Remember in verse 1, it tells us, in the spring, at the time when the kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. But David remained in Jerusalem. The key point here is that David did not go where God needed him to be. He was out of God's direction. He was out of God's presence. And remember, they took the ark with them, so the presence of the Lord was with the army. David was just at home chilling while his men were dying, and he wasn't leading the way God intended him to lead. So many times in my life, I get out of God's will and God's purpose. I stop reading the Bible for a few days, and it becomes really easy to give into temptation. And before you know it, self-control is out the window. It doesn't take long for this to happen either. Even though I've been reading the Bible and trying to do my best now for the last almost eight years, it would almost take less than a day for me to fall if I'm not staying right where God wants me, in his word, in his presence, and trusting in him. I struggle with self-control in my life. Um, most areas, I'm okay. But if you put a plate of food in front of me, nine times out of the ten, I'm going to overeat, especially if I'm alone. And this is something that I need to repent and go to God for and give it to him. And I'm weak. I haven't done that. I haven't trusted God with that. And I know that every one of us in here struggles with a part of our lives with self-control that we feel weak. Because I tell you what, after I overeat and after I get to that place and I'm miserable full, I always feel horrible. I always feel horrible because I knew my limits, but I didn't trust God with those limits. I tried to do it on my own. We all have areas of our lives that we have very little or no self-control over. And if we don't turn to God and give it to him, and if we don't listen to his words and listen to the Holy Spirit talking to us, like I tell my kids, the Holy Spirit isn't just a voice, it's our conscience is real, and it's truth. If we're not listening to God, and we're out of his presence, then we are going to fall because Satan has an end. Satan will come charging. Satan likes to sneak, sneak around, but if he finds an open crack, he's going to charge, and it's relentless. And if we don't have Jesus Christ in our lives, that charge is going to overwhelm us, and he's going to run right over us. So today... I'm going to stand in front of you and ask God to forgive me for giving in to food and overeating, giving in to my flesh. And with everybody in attendance here today, I'm going to dedicate myself to listening to God's word and losing the weight and trusting him. Now, y'all are my witness. Hold me accountable, please. Be my brothers and sisters and hold me accountable. I'm, I'm, I'm needing you. Um, without, without being around godly people, there's another way that we slip. And I couldn't imagine being around more awesome godly people than all you guys out there. I'm going to tag in Brother Sean right now and let him bring us home with the end with his message. Thank you all for listening. Good morning, church. Sorry if I, I look like a colored on banana today. I didn't, I didn't think about how it was all yellow. We're going to take this journey a little bit further, right? Um, we're going to look at, look at Jesus in the wilderness. Um, we're going to start at Matthew 4.1. 
Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. I'm assuming at this point, right, it's an intense hunger. And Jesus got this feeling. He's like, I would do anything for food right now. I've been sustained, but I want something to eat, right? And the tempter came to him. He said, if, if you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. And he answered, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. So now let's look at 1 Corinthians 10.13. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide a way of escape that you may be able to endure it. And I love that it says that, right? God's word isn't going to prevent sin from happening in your life. It's not going to prevent any of these things. It's not a, a uh, a spray that, that you put on your life and just everything is cool. But God's word will help you move through and it will help you endure and survive these things as they happen. Satan often comes to you first to test where you're at so he can catch you off guard. But how will you respond when you're presented with an opportunity, when you're presented with a situation? Um, what does God's word say? What are your actions, are your actions, your words, whatever, are they praiseworthy? Do they bring honor to God? If Jesus came back, would you be ashamed to tell him what you were doing or what you said? Some things to, things to think about. Many of you have heard my testimony uh, about my addictions uh, to pornography and sex, and, and for a long time was all that I thought about. For several months after coming to Christ, I had cut out all the pornography, I, you know, I'd stopped cheating, but I would still see women in public, and I would still have thoughts, and I would have to constantly repeat in my head over and over again, to look at a woman with lustful intent is to commit adultery in your heart, and over time, I found that my eyes didn't linger, that I was able to bounce, to bounce my eyes when I would see something to immediately uh, to immediately process that I didn't want anything to do with that and just keep moving. And now I feel like I couldn't force myself to have those thoughts if I wanted to. But I had to remind myself of what God's word said over and over and over again. So God doesn't take the sin out of the world when you're saved. For him to do that would remove you from the world. But he gives you tools to make it easier. So let's look at our second situation. We'll go back, back to Matthew, Matthew 4, 5. Then the devil took him to the holy city, and he set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and he said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against the stone. And Jesus said to him, Again, again, it is written, You shall not put the Lord God to the test. So now we see Satan. He's coming in. He's coming a little harder this time. He's like, All right, well... Let him step this up a notch. He sees where you're at with your relationship with God. And now he seeks to confuse you, right? He seeks to twist true words into places they don't belong. What Satan said was true. There's, there's not a lie in there, right? But where, where it's said, the way that it's said, is he's taking God's word and he's twisting it against you. He's trying to justify trying to justify that sin. And he's trying to say it in a way that would cause Jesus to sin. And I think this is kind of a common thing for, for some people is, you know, we, we, we try to justify, we try to justify sin. Well, you know, I'm close to God's standards. Or at least, you know, I'm not doing that sin, right? And at that point, you take sin and your eternal damnation and you just put a pretty little bow on it and you sit it off to the side and you're like, oh, that's nice. And again, we see Jesus lean into God's word. If you're presented with information to a situation and it makes you question what God has to say for you, it's probably not from God. I know when I'm, when I'm, in, when I'm into a place where I'm not sure what the direction to go is, I have to stop 
I have to clear my mind. I need to pray. I need to talk uh, to, to my brother Mike. I need to talk to, to William. I need to talk to my wife. I need to read God's word. And it's okay, right? It's okay that I have, I have friends to lean on because I can't do this by myself. And that's, that's what you guys are for, right? You guys are my family. When I'm having a hard time, I have to come to my family. So now let's look at Matthew 4, 8, right? The final, final situation in Jesus' uh, journey through the wilderness. And again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all of the kingdoms of the world and all of their glory. And he said to him, all of these I will give to you if you will fall down and worship me. And Jesus said, Begone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, the angels came and were ministering to him. So finally, we see Jesus, Jesus, all right, this is done. This is over. He's had enough. Once Satan sees that you're headed in the right path, that you know your stuff, right? right? So Jesus has already come at him with a word a couple times. He has to come harder. Satan, Satan sees the prize, right? He knows what you're going for. He sees it at the end of the tunnel. So he takes, takes what you're looking for, the things that, that, that you're going for in your life, and he amplifies them in your heart. And he tells you, you can have it now. It'll be even better than, than waiting, right? You can have it right now. Why wait? You can do it all on your own. So Jesus is king, right? He's, he's the king of all kings. He said instead of pain, instead of suffering, instead of betrayal, you can have it all right now. This entire kingdom, it's yours. But that would have ended in Jesus failing God's plan set out before him. Ultimately, it would have condemned all of us, keeping us severed from the Holy Spirit in God's presence. And it's something that, that we have to keep an eye on when we're looking at the self-control is what is God's word for us? So when we start looking at how do we utilize self-control, we have two, two ultimate defenses, right? First is through Jesus. In relationship with Jesus, we grow closer to him through prayer. And uh, when you look at a, at a relationship, you know, some of you that have been married for years, what is the greatest strength of, of any healthy relationship? And nine times out of ten, you're going to say it's communication. If you don't have good communication with the Lord, you have a bad relationship. It's, it's not there. You can't, it's not, it's not one way, it's got to be both ways, right? There has to be good communication there. Otherwise, it's, it's empty. And second is through his word. If we want to practice his word, if we want to live by his word, we have to know his word. I mean, it's, it's, it's plain and simple. You can't practice something you don't know, right? You ever, you ever show up to play a game and you just start playing it, right? If I don't know how to play baseball and I show up on a, on a football field and I, and I start, you know, immediately trying to play tennis, right? None of that makes sense. And neither does trying to say that you're Christian and not knowing anything from God's word. Finally, let's look at Titus 2, 11, 14. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-control, self-control, upright and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. I think it's cool. I got a word this morning that it is coming. It is coming. And when it gets here, you will see it and be glad. You will not be left out. And I want to say that if you need help, if you need guidance, come find Pastor Mike or, or myself after service, and we'll get you connected to somebody. Um, or, you know, we'll if we can if we can help, we we will. Because um, I know.
prayer is intimidating. I didn't really understand it at first, right? I'm like, I'm just talking. I just like get down on both knees. Like, I don't know, is there like a ritual for that? Or, but we're more than happy to talk to you because it isn't, it isn't necessarily as as intimidating as as it's made out to be. Um, and the same thing, same thing for the Bible. Um, there's a lot of there's a lot of words in there, and uh, it's a very big book, and it's also a very intimidating thing to start. But we're more than happy to sit down, more than happy to sit and, and talk with you, and explain that it doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be intimidating. You don't have to know where to start, you know. And that's that's why Jesus sent his apostles out in pairs, is we weren't meant to do this by ourselves. He knew that one was going to have to lean on the other when things got hard. You know, iron sharpens iron. And that's, that's the way we are as the body of Christ. You know, we might not be Jesus' disciples, you know, the, the immediate apostles, but we are, we are descendants, right? We are, we are disciples in this day and age. And we are meant to go out together to spread this message. And when I look out at you guys every Sunday, I just, I think that, that heaven wouldn't be heaven if you weren't all there. Amen. And I want, I want to help you guys, and I don't want for any of you to feel condemned by, by some of the stuff I'm saying, but there's a lot of sin in our lives that I think we, we tend to overlook. And a lot of times it, it comes from that self-control. It comes from the lack of um, willingness to look at it and be honest with ourselves and say, hey, we, we need to make a change. I just want to say, Pastor Mike, you did a great job today. Can we give him a hand? And Pastor Tanner, um, if you're watching this, we all hope that you're having a great, great vacation. Um, great, great uh, service uh, down in Missouri. If you're not watching it, then if you guys could tell him I did a great job. <laughs> That'd be all right. And uh, Joel, Joel also have a great vacation. Um, he already slipped out, right? So there is no outro music. You're stuck with me. Um, and I'd like to thank Joel and his, his team of amazing, amazing uh, uh, musicians and, and singers and just the, the excellence and the quality that they bring every Sunday. They're here super early. 